So if you're a little bit like me, you're worried about the environment, or actually very, I would say even more, I'm actually deeply concerned about what's happening all around us, and I am increasingly frustrated with what, what the lack of action or so from, from the politicians. Well, what's going on here? <laughs> um, this, in this upcoming talk, um, Theodore is uh, going to tell us how data science uh, can try to find what points, what pain points need to be addressed with priority. And I'm really looking forward to hearing this because I think this is going to affect all of our lives. Over to Theodore. Thank you very much for this kind introduction, Sifu. Um, yeah, good evening. I, I heard that I'm the last talk of the day here. So I'm not going to be extra quick, but I'm not going to be extra long either. Before I start, though, I would like to know a little bit about you. So I'm going to ask you some questions, and I would like to have um, some answers from you just by a show of hands. So who of you um, does self-identify, maybe, as a hacker? Who of you does? So those are like some. OK, thank you very much. Who of you works with larger amounts of data or would call themselves a data scientist? So that's most of the guys here and the people, people in here. Perfect. And who of you is some kind of a natural scientist and is maybe just here to refresh their memories of ecology? So, OK, so that's... And who of you is in none of these cate categories? Wow. OK, that's also quite a much. So, so my name is uh, Theodor Sperlia. I, um, I'm now, right now doing a PhD in Marburg, where I also studied. I studied biology and focused on the genetics of microorganisms. And now I'm doing a PhD in uh, bioinformatics. And I'm studying ecology of, lake, of the lake microbiome. Um, please, to, to, to let me start, let me tell you a story. Uh, this story begins 4.5, 4.4 billion years ago, when Earth started to be cold enough so that water could start to accumulate in first oceans uh, formed. Shortly thereafter, amazingly, shortly thereafter, the first um, form of life emerged. Uh, we know this, or we assume this, because 3.5 billion years ago, some billion years ago later, we find the first fossil evidence of similar-celled organisms. Not like this, but this is the only Creative Commons image I found, which looks nice enough for microorganisms. They are hard to, uh, to give an image to. So these first forms of life emerged, and with this it started a new, um, a new age, or a new a way of things developing. Because right from the get-go, you had a process of change and adaptation, of mutation, of um, yeah, diversification, which then emerged from that. So through evolution, as we call it, you have a diversification and life starting from single, simple cells, or something like this, uh, started to diversify and conquer all of Earth. First, the watery terrains, and then uh, got more diverse and more special than the land and the air. And every niche that is available, every way of living that is thinkable, or not even thinkable, but rather possible, is currently more or less. Uh, there is something, some organism that lives that way. And this went on and on, and uh, organisms changed, and um, some of them look rather scary, some of them looked rather nice. We know all of this from uh, fossil evidence, so we dug in the ground and found some fossils or something, and looked at it, and we said, said oh well, it must have looked like this. But from time to time, what happened, and what happened five times in Earth's history, was a catastrophic event called mass extinction, where 75 to 90 percent of all species went extinct in a blink of an eye. Uh, the most uh, 
well known of this is the last one that happened that killed the dinosaurs, which happened through a, a meteorite, as I think most of you know, right? So this ended the age of the dinosaurs, um, but then also this enabled something else to happen, uh, which is that every time such an extinction event happened, is that new forms of life could have used that space that was freed through the extinction to foster. Um, the extinction events usually, again, I, I told you, 75 to 90 percent killed almost everything. Some things were left behind, so when the age of the dinosaurs ended, the age of the mammals started. This is a rather late picture for mammals. Uh, there were a lot of different mammals before that. Also, the age of the birds started, but come on, birds. So, and the, the age of the mammals then led to, well, the age of the mammals then directly led to the age of the humans, the Anthropocene. And this is a very special uh, age in geological terms because it's the first time that a single species um, shapes the whole face of the Earth. Earth. When it said the age of the dinosaurs, it was dinosaurs and not a single species of dinosaur. But now it's just us. And what we're doing is we're building crazy stuff. Uh, when you came here, you have either used a car or a train or a plane or maybe a boat, I don't know. But you used a lot of infrastructure and things that were built and created by us, which no other species really does to this extent. And what we're doing by this is we're changing, we're changing again the, the face of the earth, a lot of the land that is surrounding us. We're building cities, large cities, that uh, remove all the living most of the living species from that land at all. We create uh, streets that cut through forests or plains and separate um, biomes and species, and by that we reduce their gene pool and make them more likely to go extinct. Um, we're using plastics, which are by natural physical forces turn into microplastics, and they, those are all over the planet. We, of course, also produce a lot of CO2 and create a climate change that is uh, man-made and is a lot of problem. I'm not going to talk about climate change here. I really want to stress that, because these are linked problems, with the problem we have with ecology now, and the climate change problem, but they are different nevertheless. Also something very interesting, and I don't think, I don't know whether you thought about this, is the amount of light we produce, which really changes a lot of um, processes in nature, because usually light was only there at day, and now we create a lot of light in cities at night. So this really changes uh, um, everything, kind of. We, what we, in, in a certain sense, do is we take ecosystems and out of these we create techno-systems. We remove everything that is ecological about them. Actually, when you think about it, in your house, in your room, this is an ecological ecosystem-free zone. You, won't, you only want those organisms in your house, in your room, that you put there. If there's something else, a spider or something, you really think about killing it just to get rid of it. You really don't want ecosystems around you. This is what we do to a big part of Earth. But I might ask you, is this a problem? Is this a problem? So what we know, we don't know a lot, there is a lot we don't know. But one thing that we know is, for example, what you might have all heard in the last year or two years ago on the radio, 
No, actually, last year. We're not in 2019 yet. But soon we'll be in 2019, then this will be in two years, two years ago. So, uh, over the last 27 years, the insect biomass in Germany was reduced by 75%. This means when you take a, um, a box and you go through the air and you collect all the insects that you can find there and you put them on the way, this will weigh 75% less uh, than 27 years ago if you have done the same, same thing. This, of course, is only one publication, but more and more publications confirm this finding. And now you might think, if we are reducing the amount of insects so radically, this might have, have an effect on other organisms. And we see something like this for birds and for, 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 um, for plants, of course, flowering plants. But actually we see this in uh, all species, all kinds of animals. So in the last 100, 200 years, extinction rates rise rapidly. This means that organisms that were there before, species that were there before, are not out there anymore, either extinct completely or extinct in the wild. This should, uh, I think, really worry us. Because um, the question now is, how close are we as a source for an extinction to those mass extinctions I told you about, I told uh, you earlier? And this is quite close. This is a nice uh, figure that I found somewhere and I had to re re redo it. Um, just look at the, for example, the mammalia. Those are mammals, reptiles. Some of the names you, you can understand. But the most important thing here is that the space from the bars to the red line, which would then qualify as a mass extinction, is not that big anymore. And uh, I hope you can see that this will only rise. So scientists are now arguing, and they're actually not really arguing, but they're getting, uh, uh, coming together uh, to the idea that human beings, human, humankind, might be the next, the sixth mass extinction. So we are as bad as this meteorite that killed all the dinosaurs. How do you feel about that? I don't know. Actually, I don't think that I'm telling you much new here. And I think I need to tell you this anyway to, one, refresh your memories, because this is our motto, right? And then the other thing is that uh, we need to frame it. I, I, on purpose, I didn't put many images of cute-looking animals in here, but rather took the uh, part of the data. And what I found most interesting when I uh, prepared this talk, I thought about the movies I saw in the last years, and so many of these movies actually are about this problem. And it's not only about like uh, uh, amazing beasts and where to find them, where a guy goes out to save as many animals as he can, uh, but even the bad guys in our movies are doing this somewhat better than us. When you think about the last Avengers movie, Thanos really tries to save ecology by killing half of it. That's a bad idea, but at least he wants to try it. And I don't know whether we are at that point yet, at the point that Thanos is about. And what's even more problematic, I think, you know the Deutsche Bahn, most of you? And this Deutsche Bahn has a magazine, and the last issue of the magazine has, has this issue on its cover. So if the Deutsche Bahn knows about a problem and really wants to put something on it, we really should do as well. <laughs> so, um, let me get some, please clap on so that I have some time to drink. Water tastes so much better when someone's clapping. And um, so to get more into it, I would just now want to talk about what an ecosystem, how we can think of an ecosystem, not really what an ecosystem is. So 
for you computer scientists and data scientists and so on. You know networks, right? So you can think about an ecosystem as a network. You have nodes, which might be uh, animals or species or groups of species, and you have interactions between them. Here I have a very simplified version of this because of two reasons. On the one hand, it's quite hard to put to fit a very detailed network on this slide, and I won't be able to tell you about it because it's too detailed. On the other hand, it's because we don't know it in, for many ecosystems in a very fine detail. So I just put some plants in there, algae, insects, fish, and so on and so on. And I put only two kinds of interactions, positive ones and negative ones. I hope you forgive me for this simplification. So this ecosystem is a network, and it behaves somewhat like a chaotic system. Uh, somewhat in some other senses, it does not. So it's not really the case that uh, a, a small change in input... So no, it... Oh, well, I don't know really. But it might be the case that a small change in an input leads to a drastic change in the output. But what's uh, even clearer is that you have a sense of robustness in these systems. So you can change uh, most of the parameters for quite some, um, and it doesn't really break. But then if you make more changes, this system will break. So this is a lake ecosystem, most because, most of all, because I study lake ecosystems, and I don't really study the whole lake ecosystem, but only the small part in the left bottom of this. And I just want to go to this a little bit more because we don't really know, I don't know, I, don't, I never know whether I should say I don't, we don't, any, don't know anything, but we know next to nothing about this. We know that there are a lot of organisms in there, abbreviated with uh, Greek uh, uh, letters, and we know that there are a lot of abiotical factors that have something to do with these bacteria and that interact and that bacteria, certain bacteria can only live with certain abiotical factors, but we don't really know many of the um, interactions there. But let's go back to our ecosystem and let me tell you some, to give you some idea of how these ecosystems are getting uh, worse and worse, let me go through three ways of disrupting an ecosystem. For example, what you could do is uh, you could put too much uh, nitrate on your acre, and this nitrate will get into the rivers and get into the lakes and the seas, and this will lead to a lot of nutrient, uh, which you could think that it is a good thing, because for your plants on your acre, it is a good thing. But on the lake, in, in the lake, if there are too many nutrients, this will lead to a lot of growth for algae and plants. And these algae and plants will then, on the one hand, reduce the amount of light that goes into your lake, in the, in the lower parts of your lake, and the amount of oxygen that is available in this lake for other organisms. This, in turn, will lead to a giant wave of uh, death for insects and fish. And then, of course, frogs and birds will die too because they don't have anything to eat. And now your ecosystem is dead. A second way of doing the same, exact same, same thing is to bring in an alien species. So now an alien species is, of course, not from Mars, but maybe from North America. And maybe you bring in another frog species. And this frog species, which is, uh, this is a, a real case, brings with it a new disease, like a fungus or something. Um, again, this is a real example, and uh, what happens is that this fungus will uh, kill many of the frogs that are here, the new frog species will be resistant to the fungus. No problem there. But our frog species that live here will not be, so they will die. Also, the new frog species might just eat too many insects, so the insects will die too, let's say. This will, again, turn the birds and the fish to dead birds and dead fish, and the algae will have a good time. And now you have a dead ecosystem again. And the third thing you could do is you could change the ecosystem on a geographical uh, uh, level. And here's where our system, our model, 
of an ecosystem as a, a network really starts to not work anymore. Because if you build a dam and you enlarge the lake, you don't really, uh, it's hard to see from this model what will happen. But what will, could happen is that the fish have more place to live, so maybe they meet less and they mate less, so then you have less fish. Or maybe the algae will have more space and they will spread out more, and this will again lead to the same thing that happened earlier. It's quite hard to say with a dam what happens. And again, this is a remind, reminder that there are other layers of information, geographical and evolutionary or historical data uh, information that is needed to really model an ecosystem correctly. So let's talk about what we can do about that. And I think if we not talk about like what we can do in our everyday life, this is a very important topic, but f maybe for another talk or for another dis discussion. I will talk in this talk more about um, more systemical things to do. And I think there are two main uh, paths that we can go about. And I think these two paths are not exclusionary, but they are needed both. And one thing is just leave Earth alone. But maybe not whole, the whole Earth, but just half of it. There is actually a project which is called Half Earth Project. Uh, and there is a, a great book that is called Half Earth, written by E. O. Wilson, where he argues, and this organization argues, that you should keep half of the area, surface area of the Earth away from human impact. Half of it. We, humans, we live on the other half of the Earth, and nature will thrive on the other half. The half will not be like that, straight in the middle, but it will be uh, mathematically half of it in patches, and these patches should be as large as possible, and so on and so on. Because right now, humans have impacted 77% of land and 87% of, uh, of ocean area, and of ocean areas that are not covered by ice. That's a lot, and this is really a problem. If, we, uh, if you ever get the chance of arguing for enlarging natural reserves or safe spaces for nature, please do that, because in these nature can recover and nature can do its own thing without us interfering anymore. Especially if you think about the Amazon in Brazil, I think this is something that many of you might have in mind, that this, I think this will not get better just by itself, and we really should, uh, as, as humanity, we should work that much, um, most of the Amazon is still in untouched uh, shape. This is very important, again, uh, leaving as much of the Earth for, for nature as possible. But then you can only do this so much, and we also need to think about the other half of the Earth, because we need food, we need places to live, and uh, this will still be a lot of impact on these areas. So the other uh, suggestion that I would uh, make to maybe you uh, in this room uh, and on the internet, of course, uh, to, to do something about um, a sixth mass extinction is to hack it. Because we are now, of course, in a hacking a conference. This is, of course, what we should do. Just hack it and this will get better. Um, uh, earlier today, I was in the talk uh, of Frank Rieger uh, with hacker ethics, and I thought, oh, well, I should have uh, looked this up before I prepared the talk, because there are many, many parallels that I would have taken if I have had known this, but I didn't, so I didn't. Um, but I think uh, when you go to the general mindset, as far as I understand it, of a hacker, it is you have a system there that is kind of a black box. You cannot really see it how it works from the outside, you find a way in, you open it up, and you, um, you use the information that you have gained about the system to either destroy it, maybe, or leverage it, or make it better, maybe. And uh, this is something similar that, I, uh, that should be our second solution, but instead of hacking 
a computer, if you're this guy sitting in absolute darkness in front of your computer, instead you should hack Earth. <laughs> um, and of course, you shouldn't know something about the, the black box system to destroy it or to leverage it, but to keep it alive as best as you can. So, to do this, we need more information how to put this into data, because data is what we're uh, working with, right? So let's go back to our lake ecosystem. And on this slide, again, we have this network um, model in front of us. You can put uh, many of these things into numbers. You can, of course, count the number of organisms that are in there, and uh, you can measure the interactions between them. You can then use these numbers to um, to do some modeling, and this is a very, very, um, uh, a very, very simple model of just a predator-prey relationship, uh, which how and how it changes over time. And what's really interesting is that it has such a shape. When you have on the x-axis the amount of prey and on the y-axis the amount of predators, uh, this will be uh, over time. This will circulate around a certain number. Of course, these models can get as complicated as you want, and I will not go much more into this detail, but of course we could. Um, so the best thing that you could have in terms of data uh, when it comes to ecosystems would be interaction data, because ecosystems as a, as a network are defined by the interactions between the um, members of this network. Uh, these interactions uh, should be then very detailed and in very um, between uh, single organisms and so on. Uh, the problem is that it is very hard to get this data because you need to get outside, and you will need to sit in uh, in the forest or in your ecosystem of choice, and you would have to wait and look and see um, who interacts with whom. And uh, while this might be feasible for larger organisms, let's say elephants, wolves, or something like that, this is very infeasible for, for example, say, insects. How do you want to um, measure the interactions between them? Of course, there are ways to do, them, uh, to do that, but still, it's quite hard. But another way to, uh, to get something like interaction data would be to track movements. Uh, so this is an image of organisms uh, that are living in the sea, different organisms. And from the movement data, you can, as you know as hackers, because you say, well, we don't want any movement data from humans. We do want movement data for animals. Um, you can say who is connected to whom, who is living with whom, what kind of work does he or she do. The same thing you can do with animals. Uh, but it's quite hard, again, to, to collect movement data for animals. Uh, what you can do is to put a GPS sender into the bodies of the animals. This has become easier and easier right now. Just a few uh, weeks or months ago, a new module was added to the ISS called ICAROS, where it, uh, which makes it easier to track movements of organisms with a GPS sender. But still, you would have to bring the GPS sender to the animal, and the animal cannot be too small because it needs to carry this GPS sender without being um, harmed or anything by it. So um, another way to, to get some data is to simply, more or less, count the amount of organisms of every species that you have in your ecosystem. Um, I told you that I work with bacteria and microorganisms, so I want to present to you how we do this for, for microorganisms. We take a sample, for example, from lakes, but you can also do this for soil or any other uh, uh, ecosystem. For example, your skin is an ecosystem just as a lake or something, so you could take a, a sample of that. Uh, but let's say you have enough bacteria in this sample, you can extract the DNA, from these microorganisms quite easily, actually, in the lab. And then the next step would be to sequence it. So you take the 
physical object, this DNA, and you turn this uh, with a quite expensive machine into data, into text data, actually. And what's more, more interesting is this text only contains of four different letters. Those is, so this is quite easy to work with for, for you as an informatician. This uh, DNA you can then use to uh, find out what organisms lived in your sample before you killed them um, by just looking up in some database what DNA sequences are present in what organisms. Again, this goes for microorganisms, but of course as well for larger organisms. And then you can do some not so fancy analyses, for example, simple correlation between m many samples, and you can say, of course, uh, uh, if these, if two different organisms correlate over many samples, they might be uh, associated, and that they might interact in nature. So that's what I do right now. I have two kinds of news now when it comes to data data science, data ecology, and how this might help us to save uh, us all from a sixth mass extinction. And the good news is there is a lot of data out there. Before I looked in this, uh, before I looked for, for the Creative Commons of my images, I had this Toy Story meme in there with data, data everywhere, because there is a lot of data out there in public databases where it's really easy to download, just right click it, it's public, and so on and so on. So there is a lot of data out there. People create a lot of data. Um, most of this data is from smaller um, surveys where they took two or three sites where they collected some data and put them on the internet. And the other thing is that uh, this data is in a lot of shapes and a lot of uh, different data is out there. Which brings me then to the, the bad uh, bad news is, for example, batch effects. I don't know whether you know this term, but it simply means that if you have a different method of uh, extracting the DNA from the samples or extracting the sequence from the DNA and so on, this will change your, your result. So most of the um, data that is out there currently is not easily comparable because it was generated uh, with mild differences. So this is a problem, and this is uh, like the bad news of data ecology. With that bad news, actually, I want to sum this up, and I want to tell you that I, what I told you. I told you that we are facing right now a six mass extinction, and what I didn't tell you, but what I should tell you is, we should not uh, make the... the um, we should not think that we as humans will survive this six mass extinction. We're just too large of an animal. We just use too much uh, other organisms around us that will most likely go extinct, so we will go extinct as well. We are facing a six mass extinctions. There are, I think, two different ways of avoiding this mass extinctions. The two ways need to go together to really do the job. The one uh, thing is that we should uh, leave our hands away from as much of nature as possible. And then those places where we cannot keep our hands away from it, we need to understand more. And a good way to understand it is to use more data, more data, and analyze this data more thoroughly. But there is a problem, which is batch effects. But before I really want to, to, to finish, I want to give you a small invitation. Because when I <coughs> prepared this talk, I noticed that I will end on a bad note. It's never good to end on a bad note, isn't it? Especially when you're the last talk of the day. You will all go to bed with a bad mood, and I don't want to do this. So I want to invite you um, to, to organize and to form a new uh, kind of community, which is right now called Open Digital Ecology Community, and I'm really not happy about that name. Um, but the idea is to, and this is not, I have thought a little bit about it, I think I know what would be necessary, but I have not thought about this more. There is no infrastructure ready yet. 
So I invite you to form this uh, with me, uh, to, to come together with uh, you as generally people that are somewhat interested in data, that maybe have a hacker mindset, that maybe have some um, background in ecology, but maybe not. Maybe you're just working with numbers because you like it. And just to come together regardless of background as open. Also do this as an open source project, just as you would do an open software project. Do this, but as data science. And also do this openly so that everyone can use and reuse the data in every step of the way. Digital, of course, as in data centered, use all the data that is around and try to figure out how to use it and bring it together. And lastly, a, a community as in citizen science. I think this uh, would be a very interesting approach to bring in people. Usually citizen science projects are everyone should go out and take a, a water sample and send this water sample in to some experts and these experts will analyze them. This is wonderful. This is very much needed. But I think also we can do citizen science on the other levels of the analysis. So we can do citizen science at the analysis step and we can bring experts and non-experts together there and work together and distribute work over more shoulders. Um, please think about this and I'm really not happy with the name. We need to change that name and I don't know how. thought about this two weeks. So, <laughs> with that being said, no, I want to give you one example because I come from Lake ecology, this is what I'm always thinking about, and I told you that I think that the most pressing problem right now are batch effects. So I think what this open digital ecology community, what a very good name, isn't it? Uh, could do uh, as, a, as a pet, as a first uh, project, is to bring together all this dis different sequencing data from different sources, try to figure out how to remove the batch effects, or how to analyze data with the batch effects in mind. There are some first steps in literature that could go there, but we still need to figure out more about this, then pre-process them and process them and analyze them, and maybe at the end find something new about uh, ecology, in this case maybe lake ecology, it also might be ocean ecology, there is a lot of data out there for this, it might be soil ecology, there are some difficulties with that, but we'll discuss them maybe later and so on. So this is my invitation uh, to you uh, to do this together. With that being said now, I want to thank you. I, I really want to thank the organizers and everyone that's behind the scenes that they accepted this talk. I was very happy to hear about this. I'm very happy that you all have stayed here so long. This is the last talk. Amazing, isn't it? This is my uh, mail address. Pre please write me via mail or maybe via Twitter if you have any more questions or meet me around. And now, of course, I want to take uh, questions in the room and I'm very happy to start a discussion with you. Thank you. So that was a call to arms if I've ever heard one before. Uh, excellent. We can take uh, questions. We've got plenty of time for that. We have microphones throughout the room. Um, there's one here, one on the other side, two in the middle. Uh, there's also internet um, questions as well that will go through the signals angel. Um, please, a question is one or two sentences followed by a question mark and not your life story. <laughs> so with that, let's go to microphone two, please. Yes, thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, at the last bit, you were talking about uh, removing or dealing with the batch effects for data that has already been collected. Are there also initiatives uh, to maybe standardize upcoming data collection? And can you tell a little bit about that? Yeah, there are a lot of, uh, there are some, there, for some fields, there are a lot of them. For some fields, there are some of them. Um, this would be very helpful if there were standardized um, uh, methods, and again, they're starting to be more in place. But what I told you about all this DNA sequencing stuff is a very, very new field, not two years, but uh, 10 years, and things have not come together yet. Um, this is the one thing that would be great, 
But the other thing is, the other data is already out there, and it's free. It's out there, and if we just throw it away now, that would be a shame. Um, let's go back to microphone two again. Um, so after analyzing the data, what's your idea um, of hacking ecosystems? So improving them or rebuilding them or something else? Yeah, this has been, um, I've been on purpose a little bit, uh, didn't talk much about this because this is still something I think about a lot. Because I think, we, I mean, the first thing is to keep these ecosystem alive while still having some of the pressure they are facing right now. So the one thing is to reduce the pressure on the ecosystems, but in case we cannot do this fully in a short time, we need to figure out a way of maintaining the ecosystems while still having some of the pressure or having all of the pressure. Is that a good, good answer? Okay. Um, so how about it? Just Sorry. let me uh, to to one or two uh, sentences more. So we there are all these variables, variables, right? Every node in the um, in the network I showed you could be regarded as a um, as a variable. What we are doing right now with um, so in German you would say Jäger, in English it's more Forester. The, these guys are, in the best cases, doing maybe what I'm, I'm thinking about, of going into the ecosystems while having some of the pressure relieved or having more pressure and um, manually trying to rectify the ecosystems, in the best cases. In the worst cases, they're killing for fun, which is bad. But in the best cases, there are sculptors of ecosystems that stay alive although they are they're not in perfect shape. So with that, um, let's go to the <coughs> back of the room, uh, microphone three. Well, first, thank you for this talk and this call for action. Uh, my background is database programming, and I find it just very assuring to uh, hear this idea from you as a data scientist. Is there, do you know of any website or so to connect database analysis specialists with data scientists? Or do we need to build this? For, for, for what exactly? For connecting hackers no, yeah. with data scientists who have data to analyze. Um, in the, I don't think that this, I don't think this exists for people outside of academia. Inside academia, in your field, you know, because you've been in that field for, for some months maybe, um, you know where to go to get the data, you know where to go to get the databases and so on. So you have enough tech support? I, for now, maybe yes, but let's not, let's not start now by excluding the, the database guys, or people, sorry, the database people. Thank you. Um, microphone two in the front. Thank you, very inspiring talk. Uh, let me ask you, you mentioned towards the end of your talk uh, citizen science. If you had the choice to name one or two uh, of your favorite uh, methods or activities or tools to enable and encourage this kind of community activities in science, what would that be? Oh, that's a good question, isn't it? And I have to boil it down to one or two. I think uh, the, the main problem here is that the whole workflow is very, um, uh, will have a lot of steps, and these steps will be from different fields of academia. So there will be some standard bioinformatics steps that include a lot of algorithmics. Um, then there will be uh, um, uh, steps that use a lot of statistics. In my work, I'm doing uh, some machine learning to, to maybe get something more out of the data. Um, so it's not that easy to just say, okay, use this one program and all your fears will be relieved, all your 
X will be gone. Uh, this is why I think a community is needed, a group of people that talk and that can organize in different steps and that can maybe then still specialize, but as non-experts. Thanks. Um, microphone three in the back. Yes, thank you for your interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if you would have all the data about ecosystems and have all this data interconnected. Uh, how can this uh, contribute to stop the mass distinction of all the species? And should we not also think about the link to decision making and the role it, that has in this, the political field and yes. the... Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, there are two, two things I, 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 I have thought about this and there are two thoughts I have. Uh, the one thing, and th both are not positive. So the one thing is, um, we know so much about climate change. There is a single thing that we need to do to stop uh, climate change, and this is reducing CO2 emissions. It's very easy, actually. Uh, and it has, has been known for 20, maybe 30 years, and decision-making is lacking by a lot. So I'm really... Um, I don't know what, what else to do, what else scientists should do to change this, because I think scientists usually, they're very laid back, and they say, well, we don't know really, it's hard to say, if you ask me, well, maybe, maybe not, and, right now, so, and scientists have escalated their, their, um, their language over time, over time, and now scientists are saying, okay, if you don't solve this in three years, we're all gonna die. This is very not, not something that scientists really want to do, but there is not much more that scientists can escalate in their language to tell um, policymakers. So that's a f f one uh, step where I think very, I'm, I'm not really happy about things are going. And on the other hand, while climate change is very easy, there is only one variable that is the, if you pull this lever, everything will be uh, okay. This is not the case for ecology. There are many lever, uh, there are many variables, there are many things that need, would need to come together. So I think um, discussion with policymakers is very important. I have here uh, focused on the, the science or the, the knowledge because I think this, uh, because I myself am very um, depressed about policy making. This is my hope that maybe here, if we now find the, the solution, then maybe policymakers will listen, although they didn't for climate change. Uh, microphone two in the front. Hi. I wondered, you showed several examples of catastrophic failure in an ecosystem by, say, one parameter change or one new species introduced. And I wondered, now we have this system and we analyze it and maybe know very little of it, and then we think, oh, we only have to change one thing and the whole forest dies. Is there a way to, say, like... Uh, reduce the risk or say build like a petri dish for a whole lake or something where we can try or is there just a well we must try on the lake and see what happens there are a very very good question uh, there are many I, I i think and i hope that there are some steps from a very there are many people working right now on very uh, small pet ecosystems where they just have two or three or four or five uh, organisms that or species that interact with each other, which totally has not the complexity that real ecosystems have. There is a huge gap in this, and I don't know whether it's really possible to replicate ecosystems in a lab at all, because there are geographical uh, parts of it, so you would have to rebuild the lake in its entirety, and also there are historical features, so it does matter whether this species arrived there earlier than the other species. Um, this, will, this will maybe not be possible. It will be necessary to do as much data crunching as you can to say, okay, I think we are 50% sure maybe we can, do we have another chance, uh, choice? Okay, let's, let's do it. 
Sorry, sorry to tell <laughs> you that. <laughs> Hey, getting us all depressed here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there a microphone um, one or so? Is, a, is that a question? Okay. Um, thank you very much for this interesting talk and the uh, amount of answer they give to our questions. Uh, according to your knowledge, your current knowledge, do you think we have any chance as a species to uh, stop this extinction or only delay it? Then I would really like to say some positive things. <laughs> <laughs> I would really like to say, oh yes, we can do it. This is so doable. It's not easy, but do it. I don't know. I, I, think, I think maybe not. But I think this is not really an option. You know, there are so many places where you can say, okay, we can't do it, but still we have to try. So we cannot, as a scientist, I know that I cannot attain knowledge itself, but still I have to try. So this is maybe something like that. Maybe, maybe we cannot do it. Maybe we know right now that we cannot do it. Maybe the, the way to do it is, uh, is very bad, but we still have to do it. So um, the microphone at the back, number three. Um, I'd like to go st one step back. Uh, I seem to understand that uh, understanding the ecosystem is a big uh, thing. So what can be done to understand the ecosystem better and to be able to predict what consequences decisions have? As a data scientist, of course I tell you collect more data, analyze this data and we will find perfect insights. Uh, some other ecologists will tell you, okay, we need to go out and we need to categorize uh, uh, every single species with all the behavior in, in very fine detail to really understand the, the niceties of an uh, ecosystem. Um, so there might be very different um, answers. I think the data-centric point of view for an ecosystem is the one that scales the best to use that word, if you, if you, does this answer your question? Perfect. Microphone two. Uh, yes, thank you also for um, the idea with the citizen data, I forgot the name already, uh, community. Perfect. good name, I heard. <laughs> yeah, um, I think um, just for this idea to get drive, um, I'm, asked myself it's maybe not better for a workshop so that maybe people who are interested just gather in the front of the stage after the talk and question and answer. Yeah, that would be, that would be great. Please do that. Let's gather uh, in front of this stage later. Until, uh, unless we get kicked out of here. I don't know about that. <laughs> when do we get kicked out of this, this room? Not, right not at all. So let's stay here. After that, no, please, really do this. Let's let's form a, a small circle and let's talk about the basics of this, and maybe we'll meet again in the next few days. So, microphone one. Hi, um, I'm interested. I'm interested in soil. You mentioned yeah. there's a problem with soil, um, and I'm. 100% sure there's over 9,000 people who will send you soil samples like maybe a million people who are just like farmers or gardeners or just eco enthusiasts who if they know on what to test they share it yes. it's like i'm 100 percent sure but what's the problem with soil in your uh what you tease it like what's the problem okay uh, what what uh, please let me ask you a question back what what in soil are you interested in? Just generally, or um, do you work on soil? Uh, building building humus, maybe sequestering carbon okay. as a solution. I don't know if it works. I really don't know, and I don't know if if the science is like if there's a consensus in science that it's bullshit or it's not. No, 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 no. I don't want to go that ba uh, that that far. Um, there's a big. I'm coming again from, from, from a microbiological point of view. And uh, in microbio, uh, microbial ecology, there is the question whether everything is everywhere, but the environment selects. So 
you could say that if you take similar ecosystems, all the bacteria that are in the one ecosystem would also be in the other ecosystems with some uh, changes because of there is more salt or less salt and so on and so on. For, for lakes, this is in, still under discussion and it seems to not be the case. For soil, it is absolutely not in discussion because every soil is, is a little bit different and they're very hard to compare. So what I said uh, when I said uh, soils are problematic is that they are harder to compare soil samples uh, than uh, lake samples, water samples uh, from fresh water would be in theory. We might figure out if we form this beautiful new group that uh, lake ecosystems are also very hard to compare, or we might figure a way out to compare soil ecosystems. So this is the hopeful answer of the day. All the other answers were very bad, but this is one we might really see that soil is easy and not hard. Okay. Um, we're starting to run out of time, but let's take those last two questions, if we can make them quick. And then uh, after that, if you want to come and meet the speaker, that would be great. So number two. Good morning. Um, you, ha this <laughs> you said we have to do two things. First, leave half of the earth uh, human-free. And the second half, make sure that our impact at ecosystem is very low. So we cannot use this first half um, maybe for producing food. Is that correct? Yes. So my question is, do you think this is possible with nearly, at the moment, 8 billion people? I think it, uh, I don't know. I really don't know. I'm not uh, that big, I don't know that much about um, agriculture to really uh, say that. I hear different things, but most people tell me that it should be possible. To, to buy the right mixture of different styles of farming and to buy some people having more intensive farming and some, most of the other people have less intensive farming and so on and so on. I don't know this in detail. Um, again, I think it must, it needs to be possible. It cannot be the case that we um, I mean, what happens in, in parts of the world, as you know, is we just take a part of, the, of a rainforest, which is the highest biodiversity of, of the whole earth, make it, uh, kill everything that's on it, and put in one single plant, and kill all the other plants again and again, and kill some of the insects, or most of the insects. And this is, um, I, don't have, I don't have words for this. This cannot be, uh, go on further and further. We need to, f we need to find a way to uh, reduce the amount of land we need for farming. Thank you. Also, I think that uh, population control c cannot be ethically. It's very hard to argue for population control, direct population control, ethically. I don't think that this is, can be directly part of the, the answer. So the very last question for number two. Hi, uh, when we look at uh, chaos theory where a system swings around different attractors and we add or remove a new attractor, this uh, system will be out of control. We can't predict it with the old data. Will we be able to predict uh, something with these data we um, collect right now when the whole system already changed? Yeah, let's say we have different samples and we have samples uh, from uh, ecosystems where all the parts are in place. And let's say we have samples from ecosystems where all of the parts are in place except for one. We took out one organism. And let's say we have ecosystems where all the parts are in place but two. And let's hope that we'll find something like this, and we can say, okay, it seems like these are all the parts that are in play, and we took out one, and we took out two, and if we put them back, maybe we can go back to the, uh, to the other samples uh, quality. 
purpose. So with that, um, we need to wrap up the question. Sorry about that. Let's thank the speaker again. Um, uh, give him a really warm applause for this great talk. Thank you. Thank you.